Welcome to another CO2 Monday. I wanted to talk today a little bit about some of the warm ambient strategy. So when you're in a hot climate, can you use CO2? There's lots of people talking about CO2 is only good in certain locations like Canada, like the northern climate countries. But I have friends in different parts of the world, for example, South Africa, that have been working with CO2 for you know over 11 or 12 years, and they don't have any issues when it's 40 Celsius out or 100 degrees Fahrenheit out. And we're seeing more and more technologies being developed. Some of the strategies that we're going to talk about today are going to be adiabatic solutions. That's one. Then there's parallel compression. Then we got high pressure and low pressure ejectors. And, and then we'll talk about you know, this kind of flooded uh, evaporators that I just mentioned there that's using these high pressure ejectors, um, ejectors in general. And there's different styles, which we'll talk about. So adiabatic solution, really, what is it? So we got this really nice Enthalpy diagram on here. It's a, a chart from Dan Foth, Cool Selector Tool. I talk about it all the time. You should be using that software because it, uh, it's a great software to, to use. So those of you that are watching, so here's the enthalpy diagram. This is one of my favorite drawings that I've done for CO2. It's, you know, we got the transcritical cycle on here. You know, we got our transcritical medium temp compressors. We go into the gas cooler condenser. This is a picture of HK refrigeration when I was out at Chilventa. There's they have adiabatic cooling systems there. So this is a gas cooler when we're above the critical point, but it's a condenser when we're below that critical point. And we all, we, depending on the strategy that you're doing, will depend if you're run, running transcritical or subcritical. Because in the middle of the winter time here in Canada, some end users run it transcritical for heat recleaning, heat recovery. Because with CO2, you could be doing medium temp, you could be doing low temp, you could be doing uh, heating, you could be doing air conditioning all in one system. In the middle of the winter, I don't know, I don't think you'd be using air conditioning because it's really cold here in Canada in the winter. But you may see that system running in transcritical for the heat recovery side, the preheat water, the heat bays, the heat, even the building itself. I've seen it, I've been into a lot of locations. But with these gas cooler condensers, there's different designs. And you really need to think about it is like, if you're in a place where it's hundred percent humidity all the time, maybe that gas cooler is not the right fit for that location. Maybe you want to go with parallel compression or ejectors or other de designs like mechanical subcooling. It all, all depends. It all depends on the payback. That's really what you want to talk about with your customers. So if you're a technician, you got to learn about how to work on it. And use it. If you're an engineer, or designer, or sales, you got to understand how to sell it properly if it's the right thing for the customer, because it'll all depend on the ROI. That's what it comes down to today. The numbers that the, the customer is going to pay buy something that's going to work for them, that can be serviced and maintained easily, and as well, it's going to be the right cost effective. Because with these new technologies come a lot of new costs, and we need to develop the right product, the right strategy. And OEMs are working on this all the time. Contractors are working all this time. But you need to understand what is the return on an investment for this, say, adiabatic gas cooler condenser. So when we talk about a dry place, like, say, Arizona or places in California that can be really dry all the time, your payback is going to be a lot quicker than somewhere like maybe Seattle or Florida, where it's really humid all the time. So this is something that you need to put into software. There's softwares out there, uh, Copeland F software, Dorin, uh, Frascol. Many, many different manufacturers have it. Uh, Corel has it. Like you got to go in and start putting the information in, or work with a refrigeration designer to do it to get a better understanding, and then you get the breakdown of what that actual payback. How much energy is it going to take to pay back this technology, and is it going to work? So there are two different real, there's probably a few more, but the main ones that I have seen for uh, adiabatic cooling are these two designs. And there may be many more, but on the left-hand side, this is a, a Ref Plus gas cooler condensing unit. They have, uh, it's a misting system. It's not, they call it an uh, atomizer. That's it, atomizer, right? Because you're, you're spraying it out and it's, it's spraying it out and as the fans on the top are, are blowing out top, it's sucking that in 
and giving it, dropping the temperature of that gas cooler. So when your temperature gets above, I don't know the exact numbers for this one, just say it gets a, starts to get above 75 or 80, it will activate uh, the solenoid. And then all of a sudden it will start to cool down the coil. And by that you're spraying out atomized water and it's coming through the coil and really dropping the wet bulb temperature for that coil. So now keeping it below that critical point. And so when we're below that critical point, we have less flash gas and that less flash ga gas is putting less work on those medium temp compressors. On the right-hand side, we're, we're looking at here, we're looking at uh, another gas cooler condenser, but these ones have pads. Same, same thing, this is a, a Vapco one, uh, really cool, design. I've seen lots of these types. Some people call them uh, evaporative coolers, swamp coolers. When I was in Australia, that's really the first time I've seen some of these design. But what happens here is you'll, once again, you'll have a, a water coming up to a solenoid. That solenoid will activate when the certain wet and dry bulb temperature, you hit that certain specific point and it'll activate it and it'll start to drop water across the pads. As the fans are blowing up the air, it will suck that, that air in there, reducing that temperature of that gas cooler. Once again, reducing the amount of flash gas coming out down the drop leg into your flash tank receiver. And it's, it's important to understand how each and every component works. When we talk about compressors, 100% more people need to understand how compressors work from engineers, the design, even pe the people at the compressor manufacturers, they need to start increasing their knowledge on compressors. Salespeople, engineers, designers, technicians, business owners, because it's the heart of the system. And I've trained thousands and thousands of people, and I still train thousands of people on compressors. We need to up our knowledge on that and how it works and what affects it. Because everything in a CO2 system or any supermarket or refrigeration system, it's going to start to affect that compressor. And we need to understand that. And then from there, we'll go into oil management, but then up into the gas cool, you need to understand the sequence of operation. When does that solenoid activate? What makes it activate? Is it, a, is it a temperature probe? Is it What type of temperature probe is it? Is it pressure that does it? There's so many different things that you need to understand on all the different components. And these are just two manufacturers. Then you got Modine, and then you got Gutner, and then you got, there's, there's lists, there's lists and lists of different adiabatic manufacturers. So you got to understand how each one of those works. So you need to spend the time to increase your knowledge on that. If you only work on Copeland, fine. Just you dive into that and, and deep and really get that deep understanding because all the components, when you understand them at the most advanced level, and then you understand the sequence of operation of a system, hands down, you're going to be able to design systems better than other people. You're going to be able to troubleshoot systems better than other people. And that's just how it is. The best people that I see with CO2 refrigeration, commercial refrigeration, they understand the products inside and out from all the different manufacturers. They understand system design inside and out. They understand how it all comes together. They understand sequence of operation. And this takes time. It takes time. There's not many people that I know that could come in here in one year or two years and understand refrigeration inside and out, be able to go and learn all the controllers because there's like 10 different major controllers around the world, understand all the compressors from twin rotary all the way up to uh, CO2 screw compressors. There's just so much knowledge to know. It takes time, okay? And what you need to do is what you're working on, you need to understand that. So if you get into the adiabatic solution and you're working on an Evapco, if you're working on a Gutner, if you're working on whoever, you got to read those manuals and get an understanding and the, those specific things. And the specific things is, when is the adiabatic activated? When it's not activated, how is it connected back to the controller? These are fundamental things you need to understand, but a lot of people skip these steps. They think that it's just going to work. We will pipe it up. We'll evacuate it. We'll charge it. It's going to work. Turn it on. But there's a lot of controls. Even for this basic, you think it's a basic gas cooler condenser. There's a lot of controls on one of these. You got fans. And they could be ECM fans. They could be variable speed fans. You got solenoids. Then you could have a, a, a pump skid that is, you know, filtering all that water. So maybe it could be a pump on the filter that's not working. So there's a lot of things involved. And what we need to do is invest the time to understand the sequence of operation of these adiabatic gas cooler condensers and understand what could go wrong 
And when you understand all the things that could go wrong, that's when you're going to be the top person at your company, technician, engineer, whatever. You understand anything that could go wrong in that system. Then you understand how to repair or fix it. You're going to be so valuable to any company globally. You can travel anywhere in the world and get a job because that is how you bring value to customers. So that's adiabatic solution. Parallel compression. Okay. Parallel compression. We talked about, I mentioned it already. What we're trying to do with this is we're trying to digest that flash gas at a higher suction pressure. So some people call this IT. Some people call this parallel compression, uh, interstage compression. There's different terminology from around the world. You got to understand it. And really it's reading the PNID. This is what I talk about in all my CO2 programs. We dive into the specific ones to the manufacturer you work on if you want. And we, I show you step-by-step on what you need to look for when you're working on that specific system, because each system is going to be different, especially with CO2. They're not cut and paste. They're not cut and paste like you see a lot of manufacturers did for the last 20 years. What they wanted to do is to pump out a lot of equipment. It's a lot of cut and paste. Yeah, same thing. So you get a higher volume. They can reduce the cost. It's the same thing. You can reduce the cost if it's the same piece of equipment, but that's not the way it is with CO2. Different applications from commercial to industrial, from one supermarket to another supermarket, it's going to have different stuff. So that same manufacturer who's building a piece of equipment could be sold to the same end user, but in a different geological uh, geolo- uh, location. And it's different, it has different components. It might look similar, but this is the key to understanding it. And with parallel compression, you need to understand when that's going to be turning on, when it's not going to be running, why is it running? And because if all of a sudden uh, that system there starts to trip, for an example, on flash tank pressure, for example, here's our fra- flash tank receiver pressure. All of a sudden, this starts to trip. And this Maybe this flash gas bypass valve, which is still in here. So we got the medium temp compressor. Going out to the gas cooler, we got the parallel compressor going, going up here to the gas cooler. And then we got our high pressure valve down to our flash tank. So all this flash gas is coming in. Instead of dropping it down to, say, 410 PSI or 30 bar, what around that, that's not equal, but up to 1,000 P, uh, 1,200 PSI or 90 bar ish bar, we're taking this at 550, 575, 600 below the trip point of that pressure relief. And it's important to understand how this works because maybe the VFD on this parallel compressor, interstage compressor has an issue. Maybe there's a set point wrong. Maybe someone was playing around with the controls and didn't understand how it's working. Maybe it's not set up properly. Controls is one of the things that we need to dive into more. Is it it's just more controls? It's no different than the supermarket I was even working on say 10 years ago, because we did have pulse width modulation valves. We did have electronic valves then. We were using CDS valves. It's just more, just more. And there's a big complexity, but you got to invest the time in training and education. You can't be going out to all these new technology stores and not have a clue of all the components on it. How does it work? You don't understand the PNID. You don't understand the electrical drawing. You need to take the electrical drawing. You need to take the mechanical drawing. And you need to put those together. So when I see this parallel compressor on the map, this is your map. This is your guide. This is your journey. This is how you figure out CO2 systems. You look at that. Okay, this is where it's piped. Okay, here's my electrical diagram. So this engages when our temperature is here. I have this much pressure coming into the flash gas. My high pressure valves here. There's uniquenesses to each system. Parallel compressor, you're going to see some parallel compression out there. It's continuing to grow. I see, I see more and more of it. Will it be, will it be the go-to solution? I don't know. You, you're going to have to work with your customer to get an understanding of what they exactly need. What will be the payback for this? For sure, it's going to be a good solution because now I'm not putting all that flash gas back into my medium temp compressors. And now I can have that pressure lift. I can have it higher. I can be running smaller compressor. And it was, a, it was good the, the first time, and this was Andre Patnode. We were walking through this and he was talking to me. He's like, Trevor, in the middle of the summer, 
the 100, 100 degrees out, 40 Celsius out. You got to design the system at maximum load. So at that point, you could have 10 compressors running in the middle of the summer. In the middle of the winter now, it's cold, you're in subcritical, you might only need to run five of those compressors. So 50% of those compressors are because of the flash gas in the summertime. So now with the parallel compressor, instead of having those five extra compressors, maybe you have one or two compressors. Now here's a huge advantage for the system design. 10 compressors or six or seven. Huge different on cost of the system. But this is what you need to understand work with your refrigeration designers. If you're a contractor and if you're a designer yourself, you need to understand this and you need to put this on. You got to plot it down. You got to see the chart. What is the, the cost? Because this is what is if we want more CO2 systems out there, we're going to have to figure out how to reduce the costs for the end users and as well as the complexity of these systems. And what I mean by that is all the different components, the training, the controls, the electrical, there's a lot to it. But this is another warm ambience, right? You're going to see see this out there. Next one, low pressure ejector. So the big thing you want to understand, they have two different designs. This one's the low pressure ejector. This is for smaller systems. And the big thing is the medium temp takes the full load. So as you can see on this diagram here, we have the gas cooler condenser. So we have our drop leg coming from that gas cooler condenser. It goes right into this low pressure ejector, okay? What else comes into it is also your medium temp suction line. So you see right here, you get medium temp suction line going into it as well and coming out of it from the high pressure receiver to the flash tank receiver. And so what we're trying to do is lift that pressure up. As you can see here, it lifts it from 43 to 101 PSI or three to seven bar. That's huge. So once again, we're reducing that compression ratio. When you reduce that compression ratio, it reduces the amount of work on a system. And so this is using less energy. Will this be for all systems? No, it's not going to be for all systems. If you go to a place where you do, in a place where there's people who do not work on a lot of CO2 or controls, it's going to be very difficult to implement this until they're trained and educated and, and worked on it and played around with it. The only way you're going to get better at CO2 is taking training and going out and working on it. It's the only way. You're not going to get better at refrigeration if you're not working on it all the time, as well as learning about a consistent continuing education. It's the way it is. Every day I'm learning more about CO2. Every day I'm learning more about refrigeration. Every day I'm putting in work to get better at this so I can train people better on it and educate more people about it so they feel comfortable and confident. With this technology here, it's already out there. 